Hello and welcome to uh, Pioneers in Medicine. This is Bruce Gewertz, Surgeon in Chief and Vice Dean for Academic Affairs here at Cedar sinai Today it's our great good fortune to welcome one of our most senior and respected surgeons, Nick Nissen, uh, who is uh, a world-renowned uh, hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgeon, as well as the director of our liver transplant program here at Cedars. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Well, listen, uh, tell us a little bit about where you were raised and uh, how you got interested in medicine. I grew up in uh, northern Minnesota. My my uh, father was a, was a Lutheran minister. My mom was a school teacher. And there was always an emphasis on education and service and and uh, and just you know helping the world and so from a young age medicine was uh, sort of a, a direction I was headed and combine that with um, you know science and learning and the sort of the, the the joy that comes with these things and medicine felt like a natural choice and uh, and they really fostered that my parents always pushed us to higher education and again it, it just fit in very well with 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 values and with pursuits that that a northern Minnesota a young man would, would have. How large a town was it? 287 people. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. Cold winters, and, uh, and we burned, as a, as a story I tell a lot of people is, we, we burned our own wood for heat until I was 16. We would go out and gather wood. It was a big project for our family and a, a wonderful memory, but it was very important to my father to be self-sufficient. And so we would go gather wood, and we literally lived off the land until I was well into my teens. That's really remarkable. Where'd you go to undergraduate school? University of Minnesota. And was that a big adjustment to go to the big city? It really wasn't. It was a couple hundred miles from our town, and uh, I had siblings in the cities as well, in the Twin Cities as well, and and through the years I have five brothers and sisters, so we stayed very tight. I actually lived with one brother for a couple of years, and my senior year, four of us lived in one house, and it's again we've we've been very close through all the years. So siblings uh, really made the journey pretty pretty special. Were you the only one that went into medicine? I was. I was. Everybody pursued higher education and and postgraduate work, but I was the only one that gravitated towards medicine. And medical school? University of Minnesota as well. And then I know you moved to Chicago for your residency at Loyola with a bunch of people that I know. Yeah, that was my first big trek out of out of Minnesota was was the match that comes along with surgical residency. And uh, I had actually ranked um, surgery programs first, uh, several of them around the Midwest. And uh, and I actually ranked family practice programs as well, further down the list. I wasn't really that committed at that time to surgery. And I remember getting the notice that I was at Loyola and recognizing that was going to be a big change. I mean, Chicago is a big city in, in the Midwest and much bigger than Minneapolis. And, uh, and it was an incredible, incredible seven years. That's terrific. And uh, we're, it's our, been our great good fortune to have you here at Cedar sinai for more than 20 years, right? Right, about 20 years, yeah. That's, that's really terrific. So um, obviously your, your skill set as a surgeon is renowned. How did you get focused on the center of the abdomen, the hepatobiliary uh, area? Well, it's kind of a natural progression through, through just um, you know, some of the things that I cherish, going through residency and having a couple of surgical mentors Jack Pickleman, Jerry Arana, some names you may know, that um, that in residency, you know, demanded a high level of, of performance and, and really perfection and understanding. And these are tough areas to operate on. They're tough challenges. The, the diseases are are big. The stakes are high. And the complexity is, is, really, um, is really challenging. But also, as you become more and more familiar with, with those diseases, those organs, those surgeries, it's rewarding. It's gratifying in its own way, and to master a skill like that, it just I gravitated towards the toughest area I could think of, which at first was was Whipple surgery, was pancreatic surgery, and then and then eventually also add to that liver surgery. And so I, I gravitated towards those, really as a as a continued challenge, not only of of surgical technical skill, but also of of ha- handling tough diseases, tackling tough challenges, and and. Uh, and, you know, uh, being a part of trying to um, fight some pretty bad diseases, you know, those organs are notorious for life-threatening illnesses. And when things go wrong, they go wrong really, 
really bad. And when they go right, um, you know, it's a real opportunity to change a person's course and to change a life. Yeah, well, your your example here has been extremely uh, inspiring to our house staff and, and the junior faculty because of how hard you work and, and what a level of excellence you demonstrate day in and day out. And we could talk a bit about many areas that you've been interested in, uh, and particularly liver transplant, where uh, under your leadership, uh, the number of liver transplants has increased quite dramatically. But what I'd like to focus on today, if we could, is diseases of the pancreas and the and that peripancreatic biliary uh, system, because I know that the uh, uh, it, it, the incidence may or may not be going up, but we hear so much about pancreatic cancer and what a challenge it is today. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about how the presentation and incidence of pancreatic cancer has evolved over your career in surgery. Yeah, so pancreatic cancer is still is still the worst cancer you can have. It still has the worst survival. It's actually increasing in incidence. And while the, the, the death rate for a lot of other cancers has improved over time, the death rate for pancreas cancer is going up. Not because the percentage is going up, but because the incidence is going up. So it's a real problem. And we have made a lot of strides with chemotherapy changes, with strategic changes of when to operate and how to operate, some changes in um, in how to handle really tough blood vessel problems, vascular problems, arterial involvement, venous involvement. Um, but we have a long way to go. And, and again, that, that field has evolved slowly. It's one of the more slowly progressing fields in all of cancer therapy. Um, but we are making strides. Um, we, we've, we've started a, a, a very nice clinic here, a multidisciplinary clinic, where we gather the oncologists, the radiation oncologists, the surgeon, the the uh, medical doctors, the, even the nutritionists and, and supportive care team, all under one uh, clinic space and, and meet patients. And we're trying to sort of pave the way across, across LA and across the, the US for, for working together because we think that the only, the only way to, to fight these cancers is through attacking it from every possible angle. Yeah, the modo, modi modality uh, uh, efforts at pancreatic cancer surely seem to be perhaps the most promising. I know as a general surgical aphorism, don't mess with the pancreas is one of the first things that you learn. And, and I guess the reason that a pancreatic tumor is so uh, uh, dangerous is that it's so centrally located in the body in one of the deepest portions and most critical portions of the abdomen. But it also has no early manifestations. And what have been the efforts for uh, blood uh, tests or other imaging tests that might detect pancreatic cancer when it is more treatable? Yeah, as you said, Bruce, the biggest problem with pancreas cancer is we, f we find it too late. By the time we find even what's sometimes thought of as early stage disease, it's usually already metastasized. So um, there are very few early detection uh, uh, studies available. There's a new push across the country for using diabetes as a screening test. You know, we've known for a long time that that some percentage of of uh, diabetic, newly diabetic patients will have pancreas cancer. But of course, diabetes is a common disease. So the question's always been, do you screen everybody? And there's a big national trial now going on following diabetic patients, newly diagnosed diabetic patients, to, to see what the incidence of pancreas cancer is. If we look at our own population, 30% uh, uh, or so of people who get who are di diagnosed with pancreas cancer will find they were diabetic, they became diabetic in the last year or two. So it's, it's a, just an example of, of a, not really a screening test, but more of an awareness. You know, if you're a primary care doctor, and you have a, a surprising diabetic, you absolutely should be imaging the pancreas to look for a pancreatic tumor. Blood tests don't help a whole lot. Um, whole body scans, help a little bit. Um, again, we're still at the infancy there because it's hard to do those every six months, you know, for, for 40 years of life. Um, genetic tests. We knew that, we know that BRCA positive patients are higher risk for cancer. We know that people with pancreas cysts are higher risk for cancer. So we, we've got a couple of high risk screening programs here at Cedars where people can be referred for lifelong monitoring with a combination of MRI and endoscopic ultrasound. 
but still that in the best case scenario that's only going to catch 10 or 20 percent of cases of pancreas cancer and and we don't have a good answer for how to catch this at an earlier stage there's a lot of work ongoing here it's probably going to be finding it in the blood someday hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do blood maybe urine there's some uh, Dr. Lowe and his group are doing an analysis of urine uh, markers to see if they could pick up pancreas cancer earlier. So maybe someday we'll have screening tests for a whole host of cancers, including pancreas cancer. But we're a mile away from that for right now. So the focus now is, is you know, finding it when we find it, trying to get people referred in a timely fashion, and then and then hitting it really hard. So what do you think the, the driver is for uh, the increased incidence in pancreatic cancer that you alluded to? We don't know. There's some thought that it may be just bigger, greater awareness. You know, more people are, are pursuing care even when they are 80, whereas years ago, 80-year-old with jaundice and a liver mass and a pancreas mass may not have even gone to the, the doctor. So part of this is just um, greater greater um, medical treatments for all phases and all stages of life. That's part of it. Um, truly, we don't have any other idea than that. It's not alcohol related. There's a little bit of connection to smoking. It's really not related to um, aging in any way other than the incidence goes up in everyone that gets older. So we don't know. We don't know. We, we've got a study coming out of Cedars showing that the, the, the greatest increase we're seeing is actually younger females females in their 30s and 40s and so that's that's been a big surprise it's not a huge increase but it's it's had not been reported before that that group of patients are actually showing more more pancreas cancer now than we've seen in decades prior a lot of interest in that and a lot of pursuits and the real hope would be that 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 cracking that code or finding the answer to that question would also lead to some breakthrough in treatment options if you could find genetic links or genetic uh, markers or genetic tendencies, then you might also be able to figure out how to how to treat it better, and and that's the problem with pancreas cancer is it is so refractory to treatments. We've got only a few lines of chemotherapy that really work well, and even in those cases, the response rates are maybe 70, 80 percent. They're not they're not like they are for breast or colon cancer. So, you know, when you start your treatment, you really don't know if you're going to respond or not. And that's a really tough burden for a patient and for the whole medical team to uh, to know whether you're you're even starting the right treatment. And that's why, again, these multimodal approaches are so important. You know, MRIs, CTs, PET scans, multiple uh, team members all trying to figure out the same thing. You know how to how to how to move from point A to point B, and ultimately. Um, Try to beat it. Yeah, how well coordinated are these investigations across the country? In other words, uh, are are there many multi-center s- trials that will allow you to segment the cancers into different uh, types and try different uh, treatments that will allow an earlier conclusion because of the greater N? Yeah, there's a few. That one of the one of the really fascinating ones is one called Precision Promise, which Cedars was one of the first centers to be part of that through the, the, the organization called PANCAN. Precision Promise is really unique because it allows for um, rapid changing of, of drugs. It's a dynamic platform. So, so a new drug can be put into the study, tested. If it fails, it's shelved. If it works, you move right on to the next phase without a whole lot of IRB approval and things. And that's across the country. And it's a good example of, I think it's up to maybe 15 centers now, maybe more than that. Um, trying to really have rapid throughput of patients and drugs so that we can get answers quickly. I remember when I was doing general surgery and it was, you know, CT was actually <laughs> relatively new then. It's much more sophisticated now and accompanied by uh, PET scans that give you biologic activity. But one of the big problems was that if you did a scan and you found a lesion in an otherwise asymptomatic patient, it was very difficult to know how to handle that lesion because the the treatment of it, some type of pancreatectomy was like no minor procedure. It wasn't like a biopsy of even a breast nodule, which can be done by needle. So how common is that now with the improved diagnostic uh, test that you have, that you find a lesion and, and don't really know its malignant potential? It's pretty rare. We That's, that's, that's very common with cysts, which is a whole nother 
a fascinating conversation, but for solid pancreas masses, we almost always have a diagnosis now. It's, it's not that hard to get the diagnosis. And in fact, the real move now is towards the neoadjuvant approach, which you know, really just means doing the chemotherapy part first. Chemotherapy first, possibly radiation, and then taking them to surgery as a later step. And um, there's, there's good evidence that that's the right way to treat more advanced cancers. We don't know if that's the right way to treat early cancers. And again, we have a trial at Cedars here looking at randomizing patients with early stage pancreas cancer into neoadjuvant therapy or into upfront surgery. And um, we don't know the answer yet, but chemotherapy and especially upfront chemotherapy is a really, really important part of the whole paradigm. Now, because of the the uh, the depth of the pancreas and the related structures, the technical ability of the surgeon has a tremendous impact, both on the uh, outcome of the surgery in the short term and likely in the outcome of the surgery in the long term in in uh, controlling the cancer. I know that you've uh, over the last uh, year or two uh, really uh, began to explore the utilization of ro robots in the surgery, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that helps you do the surgery. So the main, the, the most common operation for pancreas cancer is the Whipple procedure, which is the pancreatic duodenectomy, head of the pancreas, duodenum. Um, tough area to see, it's all around the major blood vessels, portal veins, superior mesenteric artery. And um, despite it being well known as a, as a big surgery and a long recovery, for for a good decade now, even more than that, the survival rates for that surge are really high. 98% of people leave the hospital, recover, and are able to go on to more therapy. So we've always been good at, at getting people through the surgery and recovering. But they have a lot of morbidity. Long recoveries, long time till they can eat normally, long time till they can get chemotherapy because they're, they're beat up from the surgery. And that's where robotics comes in. Robotics, you know, with, which really just means doing the surgery with the, you know, the small incision, uh, highly sophisticated robotic arms and, and, and uh, techniques lets us see things better, keep the incisions small, uh, less blood loss with robotic surgery. Um, you know, when, when you first start doing it, robotic surgeries, and we've now done quite a few, over 20 robotic Whipples now. Um, when you first start doing it, it's a little... Um, surprising how much better you can see things. You really can see vascular structures with a clarity that you could not imagine with open surgery. Even with magnifying loops, uh, it's hard to see with open surgery. So we're, we're having better vision, less, less or smaller incisions, faster recovery, less blood loss. And, and I, I really think robotics, and I was a latecomer to it because I just thought good old fashioned open surgery, that's the way to go. But once you really start seeing these structures with, with the, the magnification and even the, the orientation that robotics provides, it's hard to go back. You know, you've never seen the superior mesenteric artery as well as, as when you're looking at it from behind with the robotic camera because you can actually come in from, from the back, from posterior, and see the branches of the superior mesenteric artery. You simply can't see that from the front. And, and I think that that clearly is going to stay a major part of pancreas in fact all cancer surgeries and and all of our young surgeons are going to learn these techniques and are going to become facile with them and and it'll help us push the field to faster recovery better chemo and maybe even doing surgeries we couldn't do before uh, and and that's particularly true again with that field of pancreas cysts where where that great magnification the great exposure and and the the, the super meticulous um um, techniques you can use allow you to take cysts out that you couldn't even see before when you were doing open surgery. So it's pretty exciting. Well, it's very admirable to me. Uh, how, uh, you as a master surgeon, uh, not in your 20s, uh, embrace the new technology and have been able to uh, really push it forward. And it shows a tremendous amount of um, staying power and adventuresome. Uh, and I know your results have been, been terrific. Um, I'd like to close with a, just sort of a personal uh, side of this. I know that you were an Eagle Scout as a kid and have remained very involved in the, in the uh, Boy Scout movement. I wonder how do you think, you know, in 100 words or less, that experience equipped you for a career in surgery? Uh, scouting got me out of the small town in northern Minnesota and helped me to 
um, see the world as a bigger place and as uh, and it, it gave me a little bit of a foundation of I hate to use the word brotherhood but maybe that's a little bit of the word here but a, a little bit of a foundation for moving forward for being courageous for realizing that there are ideals and um, and and accomplishments that that are bigger than yourself and that a lot of people have have tried before and and many have succeeded and I, I think scouting just help me to wake up and 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 move out in the world and i both of my boys are eagle scouts and i'm proud to be a part of it to this day well it's a great indicator of achievement uh, future in life well nick thanks so much for being here today and for being here at cedar sinai and advancing this really challenging field thank you thank you bruce